Hey, today it's my privilege to introduce our speaker, John Dixon. Now, John makes his home in Sydney, Australia. He's a speaker, a preacher, an author of numerous books, and John is a friend of Ada Bible Church. He has graciously carved out time from his schedule, I think the last six or seven consecutive years, to be with us and to open the scriptures for us. Uh, John has this unique blend of deep scholarship and deep, deep love for people. And he will be sharing a series called, What's the Difference? And so now, will you join with me in welcoming John Dixon to our platform today? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. It, it, it is just always a joy to come back to this home church away from my home church. And the cool thing is, uh, I've really got to know the staff, and I bump into people on the streets of Grand Rapids that are members of the various congregations here. And it, it's just a joy. And the, the positive for me about having a home church away from my home church is that it lowers the performance pressure. <laughs> it, like, really. Like, it, don't take it the wrong way. I still intend to try to speak today. <laughs> but there isn't any of that performance pressure that goes with the kind of traveling ministry that I so often do. Uh, so thank you for making me so welcome. Uh, Jeff has asked me to treat a topic over these next three weekends that may be a little bit unusual. We're going to be looking at the world religions, and three in particular, and we're going to explore... What is the difference between the world religions amongst themselves and the differences between the world religions and Christianity? And hopefully we'll get to know our own Christian faith uh, better as a result of knowing the alternatives. But there are two mistakes people very often make when exploring uh, the world religions. One of these mistakes is made by the general society in the West, and the other mistake is pretty common amongst Christians. And I've seen both mistakes very often uh, in the class I used to teach at Macquarie University on the world religions. Without fail, students will either make one error or the other. The first mistake is to try and uh, blur the world religions into sameness, to insist that basically all the religions teach the same thing. We want the religions basically to be on the same page. And I think there are good reasons we want that. I think we want to keep the peace and therefore not talk about the differences. But what it ends up doing is it blurs the distinctives. I remember at university in lecture one, one of my students put up her hand and said, have you heard of the famous Elephant parable. You may have heard this. It's very well known. Uh, it comes from the Buddhist scriptures, where five blind men are summoned to inspect an elephant. And uh, the one uh, near the head thinks that it's a pot. The one near the ear thinks it's a winnowing basket. The one around the leg thinks it's a tree trunk. Uh, the one at the tail thinks it's a rope. Uh, because they're blind, they, they have their own perspective on what this is. And this student said to me and to the class, isn't that what we will be discovering in uh, this unit of study, that all the religions are basically one? And that it's just each person's perspective that, uh, that, that makes the so-called differences between the religions. Now, what my student didn't know, and what I had to sort of work out politely how to clarify, was that the original form of this parable, which comes from the verses of uplift in the Buddhist scriptures, had the opposite meaning. The Buddha told the elephant parable not to emphasize the sameness or oneness of the religions, but precisely to say, all the others are blind, and I've come to reveal the truth that it's an elephant. Because the reality is, it's not a winnowing basket, it's the ear of an elephant. It's not a rope, it's the tail of an elephant, and so on. And the Buddha said, I've come to reveal to you the truth. Now, I'll tell you that because it's possible that some people here or watching online want to so emphasize the sameness of the religions that we do the religions a disservice. You don't honor the world religions by emphasizing what is similar. 
You honor them by listening to their own account of themselves and discerning their distinctive teachings rather than rushing to blur the lines. But there is a second mistake that is often made, uh, often by Christians, and that is to view the alternatives in their worst light. It's possible, if you're a committed Christian, to be so devoted to Jesus that you don't pause to listen to what others find compelling in the alternatives. You're always finding fault because Jesus is Lord, nothing else can be even partially true. And we don't work out why a billion people might think there's something to Islam. And it seems to me, and I've always used to say this to my university class, unless by the end of this course, you can actually articulate what is attractive or compelling about Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, you probably haven't understood those positions. That's a hot tip for all sorts of debates today, actually. If you can't see what's compelling in an alternative position, you probably haven't understood it. I'm not saying you have to agree with it, but unless you can see what's compelling about it, you, you probably don't get it. An analogy might help. Uh, imagine you are an art curator of a series of beautiful paintings, uh, the, the world's most important paintings, one of which you absolutely believe is the best, outshines all the others, okay? What are you going to do when the uh, public comes in to view the art gallery? Are you going to dim the lights on all the alternatives and shine a spotlight on your favoured piece? I would say if you did that, it's a sign that you're not very confident your favoured piece stands out on its own. If you have to dim the lights on the competitors to make your one look better, you obviously aren't confident that your one can shine on its own. No, a truly assured art curator is going to turn all the gallery lights on full, going to make sure all the paintings are seen in their best light, confident that in the best light, people will come in and see what you see about the stunning beauty of your favoured piece. I offer that to you because I'd love you to do your best, if you're a committed Christian, to understand the other faiths. And I reckon that your devotion to Christ demands it. And here's the interesting thing. I suspect you'll see your own faith as a Christian in an even better light the more you understand the alternatives. It's a little bit like you only understand your own country best if you've traveled a bit and then return and go, wow, I like home. Home's great. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, and today we're going to focus on the Eastern faiths, that is Hinduism and Buddhism. And I'm going to give you a ridiculously short summary of the key ideas of these faiths. And then we're going to look at the differences uh, between them. And then next week, we're going to look at Islam. And the following week, pretty much at all the religions asking the question, can they all be true? And if they can't, how would you ever work out which was true? Okay, the Eastern faiths. The fundamental question shared by Hinduism and Buddhism is this. How can I be free from this tragic world? That is the fundamental Eastern question. And they each come up with a diagnosis and a solution that is different, but they're all trying to answer this question, a universal question. And let me set up the question by reading to you what I may have read to you before. Uh, I've spoken here so many times I, I kind of lose track, but uh, I want to read to you from the Evening News of India from October 12, some years ago. All 89 passengers and six crew members were killed when an Indian Airlines plane bound for Madras crashed within minutes of takeoff at Santa Cruz Airport at 1.40 a.m. today. The plane was only some three minutes airborne when its pilot noticed a fire in one of the engines. He was reported to have told air traffic control of the fire and said, I'm coming back. Eyewitnesses, including friends and relatives that had come to see the passengers off, saw the plane burning in the night sky like a red ball before it crashed. 
The passengers had no chance. I remember the night, well, I, I was a, uh, a boy, my brothers and I were watching television, we heard the phone go, we heard our mum take the phone, and then we heard her howling at the news that my father was on the plane, and he was gone. Those days after the accident are a blur, uh, but my mum tells me, I went up to her a few days after the accident, and I said, why did God let dad's plane crash? Ours was a home that had never been once to church. We'd never said a prayer in our home, not once. But still, this kid with no religion had to ask the question about this tragic world. It is a universal question. And so it's no surprise that the Eastern faiths are asking this question. How can I be free from this tragic world? And I want to explain to you what Hinduism and Buddhism see as the diagnosis of this problem, how they would respond to the nine-year-old John Dixon faced with the death of his father. We'll look at each in turn. Hinduism's diagnosis can be summarized in four words that seem perhaps a little scary, but don't worry, really simple. Brahman, Atman, Samsara, Karma. I almost feel like we should all say that together, but we won't. Brahman, Atman, Samsara, and karma. Brahman is just the universal spirit, the animating and unifying principle behind the universe. Not quite God in the Western sense of a personal being that you can pray to and who loves you. No, Hinduism thinks of God as uh, more impersonal. Brahman is the unifying principle without personality and division. And here's the interesting thing. There's a little bit of Brahman in you. And that's called your Atman. We might call it your soul or your spirit. But in Hindu theology, it is a bit of Brahman that actually should be Brahman, should be connected to Brahman, but it's trapped in your body. In fact, uh, two analogies are offered in the Hindu scriptures to explain this. One is the fire analogy and the other is an ocean analogy. In the fire analogy, Brahman is the fire and the spark is your soul. A spark has left the fire and is your animating principle. Not you, your personality, but the, the animating principle within you, the deeper spirit. And, and it's, it's left the fire and must return. Or a drop in an ocean. The ocean is Brahman. Your spirit is a drop that is alone, separate, but needs to return and be absorbed, merge with almighty Brahman. Now you can see humanity's problem uh, quite clearly from this. According to Hinduism, the problem is your spirit, which truly is Brahman, is trapped in this silly physical world and in this body that you inhabit, in the illusion that you, you think that that's real, but actually the real you is Brahman and you need to get back there. This is the problem of samsara. Samsara means running around. And in Hinduism, it's the idea that you keep on getting born. Your spirit, right, lives this life, then you die, and depending on how you live, you are reborn, you are reincarnated in another body. You're up or down the scale, depending on how you've lived. But the, but the thing is, all reincarnation in Hinduism is bad. It's running around. You often hear people say, you know, particularly like Hollywood actresses say, I believe that I was an Amazonian princess in a former life, right, as if that's a cool thing. Uh, according to Hinduism, it's a terrible thing. Because you've come back. When you are a drop that needs to return to the ocean, you are a spark that needs to return to the flame. You don't want to keep coming back. What keeps you coming back is karma, that fourth doctrine. Karma, it, 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 it translates as action, but what it means is it's the principle built into the universe that meets every one of your actions with a reaction. The universe is designed so that everything you do has a feedback loop. And if you've been good, it brings... Good, and if you've been bad, it brings bad. Here's the, how the Upanishads put the doctrine of karma. As a man acts, so does he become. Whoever does good becomes good. Whoever does evil becomes evil. By good works, a man becomes holy. By evil, he becomes evil. Whatever deeds he does on earth, their rewards he reaps. From the other world, he comes back here in reincarnation to the world of deed and work. So, here is Hinduism's diagnosis. 
of the sadness that befell my family those years ago. According to Hinduism, our bad actions in a former life reaped this reaction in this tragic, tragic world and bound me to this tragic world. You might think a nine-year-old boy hasn't deserved anything, but in Hinduism, that nine-year-old boy has lived other lives and is now reaping karma. And the thing you need to try and follow is that a Hindu family, a, a devout Hindu family, genuinely finds explanation and comfort in this idea. It explains all pains, all tragedies. Buddhism's diagnosis is different, but it's still trying to answer the same question. Buddha was just a man called Siddhartha Gautama, and he was a prince in northern India, raised in a beautiful palace, raised in the lap of luxury, and according to the Buddhist scriptures, one day as an adult went outside his palaces into the common places and was confronted by suffering and tragedy. He saw a poor man with nothing and no options. He saw a very sick man about to die, and then he saw a corpse on the road. And he was so shocked by the tragedy of the world, he decided to leave his kingdom and wander the Ganges for the next six years, studying amongst the other Hindu gurus to find the answer to this problem of tragedy. He felt that there was no real answer within Hinduism. So he decided to meditate under a Bodhi tree for days and nights on end until he eventually discovered the answer. And this answer was his moment of enlightenment. And henceforth, he was known as the Buddha, which just means enlightened one. And his enlightenment, his answer to the problem of this tragic world, he summarized in four noble truths. They are called the four noble truths. And the first two are the diagnosis, and the second two are the solution. The first noble truth is very simple. All existence is suffering. And the Buddha meant all existence. He asked his disciples to think of everything, your pains and your pleasures, as suffering. Why pleasures? Because they are fleeting. They arise and disappear and leave an emptiness. And if you were to attach to those pleasures that they go, you're sad. All existence is suffering, he said. He was sort of brutally honest about life. But the second noble truth is the explanation of this. The second noble truth is the cause of suffering is human desire. Here's how he put it in a famous sermon. The noble truth of the origin of suffering is this. It is this desire which produces rebecoming, accompanied by passionate greed and finding fresh delight now, here, now, there, namely desiring sense pleasure, Desiring existence, and even desiring non-existence. Desire is the thing that causes you suffering. So here's Buddhism's diagnosis of what happened to my family. The tragedy we experienced as a family was not caused by the plane crash, but by our passionate desire for Bill Dixon. Can you see the logic? If I didn't have desire for Bill Dixon, my dad, the plane crash wouldn't have affected me. It's pretty hard to argue with. And those of you who feel great losses in life, and I know I've spoken to many of you who have suffered deeply, you know that it's actually because of the things you love and desire that when they're gone, it's tragedy. That's the diagnosis according to Hinduism and Buddhism. What's the solution? For Hinduism, the solution is threefold. And the cool thing is from the Hindu perspective is that you can take your pick. It's not like three things that you have to you know, do in stages, you choose your path of salvation. 
This is all laid out beautifully in the most famous of the Hindu scriptures called the Bhagavad Gita, which is not quite the length of the New Testament. It's probably about the length of all four Gospels. And it's a long conversation between the god Krishna and a, a, a guy called Prince Arjuna. And the uh, God Krishna in, in the Bhagavad Gita appears and explains the ways of salvation. The first way is action. This just means if you do good actions, you build up better karma and get a better reincarnation. So you do more actions and get a better reincarnation until eventually your soul, your spirit, your Atman can return to Brahman. The problem is it's really difficult to do enough actions. So there is a second path. It's the path of knowledge, uh, which Krishna says is the most difficult of all the paths. This is the path of ascetic contemplation that you are one with Brahman. And if you've ever seen like an Indian documentary of a yogi in India, you know, painted, ha hasn't eaten for weeks, punishes the body, is in a meditative uh, trance for weeks on end, if you've ever seen that, that's the path of knowledge. That person is trying to think his soul back to Brahman. And when he truly can unify his soul with Brahman through thought and knowledge, he'll be released. But it's very difficult, according to Krishna. So there is this third path, which Krishna says is the most perfect path. It's the path of bhakti, devotion. And Krishna says, if you devote yourself to a favored God with absolute commitment, saying your prayers to that God, having that God's name on your lips throughout the day, doing little offerings in the home to that God, meditating in the name of that God, etc., etc., et cetera, that God will be your deliverer. Here's how the Bhagavad Gita puts that third path. He whose mind is fixed on my personal form, always engaged in worshiping me with great and supernatural faith is considered by me to be most perfect. For one who worships me, giving up all his activities to me and being devoted to me without deviation, engaged in devotional service and always meditating on me, for him I am the swift deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. Bhakti, devotion. One thing is clear from all three paths, it requires an enormous amount of effort on your part. The rigor of Hinduism is very clear. And only matched and probably surpassed by Buddhism's solution. Buddhism's solution is different from Hinduism's, but it requires massive effort. Remember, for Buddhism, the thing that causes you this suffering in this world is your desire for the things of this world. So what would be the solution? Remove all desire. The goal of Buddhism, the nirvana that Buddhists speak about, is entirely through negating, detaching from human desire. Here's the third noble truth, which explains the solution. The end of suffering through detachment from desire. And here's how the Buddha put it. The noble truth of the end of suffering is this. It is the complete cessation of that very desire. Giving it up, relinquishing it, liberating oneself from it, and detaching oneself from it. Again, it's hard to argue with the logic See, if a beggar on the street can somehow get to the point where he or she no longer desires the prosperous life, the state of beggardom isn't experienced as suffering. If a nine-year-old boy can detach from his passion for a father, the loss of his father will evaporate. And I'll experience peace in this world. So how do you get there? Glad you asked. The fourth noble truth. The fourth noble truth is the eightfold path to the end of desire and suffering. Just when you thought that you'd get Buddhism 
By just knowing four things, the fourth thing turns out to be eight things. <laughs> but actually, they're pretty easy to follow. Here's how the Buddha put the eight things. The noble truth of the path leading to the end of suffering is this. It is the noble eightfold path and nothing else. Namely, and here, here are the eight, ready? Right understanding, right aim, right speech, right action, right livelihood, just means the correct job, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Mindfulness is the daily practice of every Buddhist, Noticing every sensation, noticing every sound, every feeling, every thought as arising and disappearing. And over the practice of mindfulness throughout the day, you are able to detach from these things because you inspect them rather than indwell them. That's the goal of mindfulness. Concentration is meditation, the actual deliberate practice of meditating each day. Now, the thing is, I mean, we could spend lots of time on each of these parts of the Eightfold Path, but the, but the bottom line is this, through practicing these eight things, the Buddha said you can arrive at complete detachment from desire. And when you get there, you'll be able to live in this world with absolute equilibrium. Joys won't tempt you, suffering won't harm you, because you're not attached. Here's how seriously Buddhists take this. There's a very instructive Buddhist scripture called the Parinibbana of the Buddha, which is the total unbinding of the Buddha. It's uh, the, uh, actually the account of the death of the Buddha. And according to the text, he's lying down, he's very old by this stage, but still teaching, and all of his disciples are gathered around him, he's just teaching them very peacefully, more of the Dharma, the, 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 the truth that he came to bring, and then eventually just peacefully breathes his last. And what do you think the disciples do? They break out into weeping and wailing. The text says, they all started saying, too soon is the one with knowledge left the world. Too soon is the Buddha gone from the world. You can see where this is going. And one of them pipes up and says, hang on. Not exactly what it says, that's the Australian translation. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Didn't the Buddha teach us to detach from everything? We're not being very good Buddhists here. And they all go, oh, you're right. And in that moment, it's very instructive for Buddhism. In that moment, they choose to detach even from their love of their master. They wipe their tears away and they return into perfect equilibrium, not attached even to the Buddha. And they have peace. How different is the account of the Buddha's death from the account of Jesus' death? Which is called what? The account of Jesus' death is called the passion, isn't it? The passion narrative. Even that gives away how different it is. The Buddhist uh, teaching about the Buddha's death is very serene, I mean, there's that little hiccup, but they get rid of that. And very serene. The, 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 the passion narrative, the passion narrative, the crowds are weeping and wailing. The tragedy is there. The brutality is there. Jesus screams out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The passion. I often think Jesus would have made a terrible Buddhist. I mean, no disrespect in saying that to either the Lord or to Buddhism. But it's a terrible Buddhist because he was full of passion. Rage at injustice, weeping over people. And that's not the only differences. So let me pivot to explain some of the differences between the Eastern faith and Christianity. And the way I want to do it is not the traditional Christian way of saying what we find wrong with Hinduism and Buddhism. I want to turn it around the other way, if you don't mind. I want to tell you what Hinduism and Buddhism think are wrong with Christianity to at least help you see the differences between these two faiths. Number one, the ridiculous Christian teaching of the goodness of creation and the body. In Hinduism and Buddhism, the goal is to detach or escape physicality, sensation, matter. In Hinduism, it's your soul returning to Brahman, 
In Buddhism, it's complete detachment from all sensation. The problem is creation in the Eastern perspective. Contrast that with the Bible. The Bible, from its opening lines, is absolutely committed to the goodness of creation. Uh, Genesis 1 has good uh, mentioned seven times. God makes the light, and it's good. Uh, God makes the waters, and they're good. The vegetables, they're good. Everything good, 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 good. And then just for the dummies down the bottom, I don't mean the dummies here, I mean the ancient world, uh, it says, and it was very good. Right. So if you miss the six goods, you get clobbered across the head in the, in the last line. Very good. What's the biblical author doing? Setting out as the first doctrine that stuff is good. Material reality is good. The body is good. And so within the Christian framework, we are to view the body and the creation, food and stars and whatever as gifts of love. A little bit like uh, how I view this ring around my finger. My wife assures me it's gold. Uh, she, she, you know, it's the wedding ring. Uh, but for me, the value is not just the gold that's in this ring, is it? I get all the value of the gold, plus this physical object is brimming with the significance of love because it's my wedding ring. And the Bible teaches that, that believers are to live and walk in the world seeing all things as gifts of love, radically different from the Hindu and Buddhist concept, which of course leads to a totally different idea of what the problem is. See, in Hinduism, the problem is material creation. Uh, for Buddhism, pretty much the same idea. But in Christianity, material creation isn't the problem. The problem is how we approach or elevate or devalue physical creation in relation to God. So the problem is we enjoy these created things without giving thanks to God, or we enjoy these created things without thinking of how God wants us to use it, or even worse, we value created things over the creator. The problem isn't the creation itself, that's a gift of love. The problem is zeroing in on this and obsessing about these things in a way that neglects God, a little bit like, you know, the Lord of the Rings, yeah, and the, and, and, and the obsession with the ring, you know, my precious, my precious, right? If you haven't seen the film, that's going to sound very weird. But <laughs> I imagine if you know my wife, you know, found that I was more devoted to this ring than to her. Well, well, that's what we've done with God. See, the problem within the Bible's framework is not material; it's relational. And perhaps the best proof that the biblical narrative with the Christian faith emphasizes the goodness of creation in contrast to the Eastern faiths is that even salvation is described as the redemption of physical creation itself. Throughout many scriptures, you find stuff like you find here in Romans 8. Listen to the language, so different from the Eastern perspectives. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Just pause there and think about that. We are not liberated from creation. The creation itself is liberated from its defect and decay. And brought, the creation will be brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. What does that mean? The next lines make it clear. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Huh? Huh? Yeah, Christianity teaches not only that Jesus was bodily raised again, but that if you rely on him, you will be bodily raised again. None of this spirit going into the ether stuff for Christianity, it's bodily resurrection in a liberated creation. And my point is, Hinduism and Buddhism look at Christianity's emphasis on the goodness of creation and the body and think it's a delusion. 
that has trapped you in this world. That's what's wrong with Christianity. Well, it's one of the things that's wrong with Christianity. The other is a very important idea in Christianity, but is slightly nuts in Hinduism and Buddhism, salvation as a gift. I know Christians kind of like this idea, right? The idea that God's salvation is a free gift because Jesus died on a cross, having lived the life you could never live. He gave that life on your behalf and rose again, and so you can have a free gift, right? Do you like that? Yeah, I mean, I see some very bubbly faces go, oh, yeah, yeah I'm, that, that's it, you know? I'm ruined without that one, okay. <laughs> but the thing you've got to try and understand is that Hinduism and Buddhism think that's a cop-out. You lazy thing. If you're part of the problem, you have to be part of the solution. Woman up, take it. Hinduism's three paths that, that I mentioned, uh, action, knowledge, and devotion, they all require incredible effort on your part. But the Buddha said something similar, actually, about his own path. By oneself is wrong done. By oneself is one defiled. By oneself, wrong is not done. By oneself, surely, one is cleansed. One cannot purify another. Purity and an impurity are in oneself alone. Almost looks like he's preaching against Christianity at that point. I mean, he's not, but... It's such a contradiction. Whereas Christianity teaches stuff like this all over the Bible, like in Titus 3. I love this passage. I mean, I like lots of passages, but I'm clinging on to this one. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, right, in Jesus, who died for us and rose again, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done. Just soak that up for a second. He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And then it goes on beautifully. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And and just in case you've missed the point of grace throughout all the scriptures, the final paragraphs of the Bible, Revelation 22 Bring us home with this theme of a free gift. Look at this gorgeous passage. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. You couldn't get clearer that the life of Christianity is a free gift. And as I said, I know Christians delight in this idea, but for the sake of understanding the world religions, you've also got to try and see what they see as problematic about it. It's lazy. And for some people, it's a reason they reject Christianity. I've met people of other faiths for whom this is a genuine problem. Then again, I've met people for whom this idea of the free gift of salvation is the reason they embrace Christianity, including some people of other faiths. Buff and I have these dear friends in Darwin, Shashi and Didi. Shashi uh, was born in a Brahmin family in India. Uh, The Brahmins are the highest category of human being in India. They are the ones that are closest to Brahman, the soul of the universe, right? They are the most holy people. And her family was very prominent in her city growing up, so prominent that all of the Indian gurus that came to their city stayed in Shashi's home. A big deal. But uh, when she got to her early teenage years, they wanted to send Shashi to a good school. And the best schools in India in those days, no longer, were all Christian schools. And so her father, despite being a devout and revered Hindu, sent Shashi to a Christian school, thinking it wouldn't do her any harm and she would learn lots of good subjects. Unfortunately, from his perspective, she became a Christian at that Christian school. And uh, when she came home in the holidays and explained it to him, it was a devastation and a dishonor to this family. She was promptly married off at a very young age to a devout Orthodox Hindu. 
to sort of lock her into the faith. And sadly for Shashi, she was beaten mercilessly by her husband. Now, I hasten to add, that is not very Hindu. But he did beat her. She had to flee for her life. And she left India and came and lived in Australia and remained true to the Lord. Her family wouldn't speak to her for years. She would write to her father, begging him to write back. He would never do it. Until one day she got a letter back. Just a little open door of relationship. So she quickly wrote back. She got another letter. And so began a beautiful, for years, a beautiful writing relationship. And eventually she decided to call him. And so began quite a number of lovely conversations. The relationship began to restore. And she began to share her faith with her dad. And her dad was very standoffish at first, but then eventually said, okay, tell me what I should read. She said, read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Understand Jesus. So he did it. And over the months, came to revere Jesus. And in fact, uh, when I was at Shashi's house, she got out a, a tape. Yes, an audio tape. For the young ones, that's an old audio technology <laughs> that records sounds, and you can put them in a device that actually plays it back. It's extraordinary. <laughs> and Shashi got out this tape of her dad telling his story. Just 15 minutes, she put it on, she said, listen to this. And I listened to this beautiful, elderly, Brahmin Hindu man explained that as he read the Gospels over and over, he was utterly compelled by one thing in particular, that the leader of Christianity, other than Jesus, was Peter, who was a complete failure. He said, how is it possible that this faith sets up one of its great leaders with a man who could have, who denied Jesus, who wasn't even practicing bhakti, devotion to his Lord, who failed, and yet this Lord died for Peter. He said, and I'm, I'm, I'm virtually quoting what he said on this tape, in Hinduism we know all about gods of wisdom, gods of power, gods of judgment, gods of surprise. We don't know anything about a God that would give up himself for failed human beings like Peter. And he said, like me. And this man openly confessed faith in Jesus Christ in his city to enormous scandal because of this idea of the gift of salvation, which some see as a reason to reject Christianity. I would say, for me, it's the most beautiful thing about it. So Lord, please teach us Firstly, to know about other human beings' beliefs with fairness and sincerity. And help us, Lord, to live in this world you've created as a gift of love. But above all, Lord, praise you for Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, that we might know your free gift. Help every one of us in this room, watching online at the other campuses, see your grace, free gift of the water of life. For we ask it in Jesus' name.